Welcome to Channel 17's continuing coverage of the general elections 2018. We're so glad you could join us tonight for the governor's debate. This is the first debate that features all of the candidates for the governor's seat. And I am happy to introduce them to you. I just want to also let you know you can give us a call tonight. Today is the 18th, is that right? The 18th of October. And our number is 802-862-3966. If you have any questions for the candidates, we're happy to take them. Um, the candidates tonight have all been given uh, the questions in advance. They'll have two minutes to answer. They'll have some opportunity to cross-examine each other. And we invite your questions. We're airing live on YouTube right now and channel17.tv. And also, we will be sharing this with our colleagues in community access channels across the state. So hopefully you are watching this from the comfort of your home in some beautiful remote corner of Vermont. So without further ado, please let me introduce the candidates. We'll start with Chris Erickson. She is from Chester. We have Steve Marks from Stratford, Trevor Barlow from Cavendish, M. Emily Payton from Putney, Phil Scott, our governor from Berlin, Christine Halquist from Hyde Park, and Charles La Laramie from Fairhaven. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we're going to start tonight with opening statements. And, uh, Chris Erickson, we will start with you. Please tell us why you are running for governor and what experience you would bring to the position. Alrighty, a lot of you know me as the United States Marijuana Party candidate, and I have run with the United States Marijuana Party repeatedly in the past. Now, at this past year, Governor Phil Scott signed a little marijuana law. And I thought people wanted to sort of digest that first and see how that went. So I thought, I'm going to have a whole brand new platform and I'm going to be an independent this time. Now, my new platform is the most brilliant, sharpest, clearest plan of any candidate in the United States of America. Whether you're running for statewide office or federal office, listen up. Look at my website, ndvt.com. Indy, I'm racing to win Vermont. I-N-D-Y-V-T dot com. Now, what I'm talking about is if I'm elected governor, I'm going to hold a governor's conference and I'm going to get everybody together to sign a petition to the United States Congress demanding that they write up a bill based on my new plan. And this is it. You pay your federal tax dollars. The federal government lets the United States Congress decide how to spend them. They give billions of dollars to the NIH, the National Institute of Health. They give billions of dollars to the Pentagon, and each of these gives out millions. The NIH gives out millions to pharmaceutical companies. The, def the uh, Pentagon gives out millions to the defense contractors. They use them for research, design, and development to design new products. Now, whether they're pharmaceutical prescriptions or defense products, they start out with either a blueprint or a written design. Any blueprint or written design falls under copyright law, under work made for hire law, because we pay for it, we own it, we deserve a share of the profit. They're making trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars, we deserve a share of the profit, and that money has to go back to the 50 states to pay for health care, education, low-income housing, etc. Thank you so much. Steve Marks, your opening statement. Um, I'm, I'm running as an independent on the Earth Rights ticket. I am trying to get a constitutional amendment in Vermont to give the Earth rights. If um, corporations are considered people, the Earth should be considered a person. And, um, and what I want to do is I want to make sure that we take care of the Earth. The most important thing that we have, our mother, is the Earth. Uh, everything that we own is, it comes from the Earth. So my whole, my whole platform is to take care of the Earth, to clean up the pollution, and to, and to help us all. What qualifies you to be governor, besides your strong feelings? Um, I was a, I've been a selectman in Stratford for four years. I'm the health officer in Stratford right now. Um, I, I've been on the planning commission. I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 love, I love community service. To me, being, a, um, being in America is community service. It's taking care of the people around you and f and that is the, and and taking care of the people is taking care of the earth and it's all the same thank you very much trevor barlow why are you running and what qualifies you to be governor thank you uh first of all i'd like to say that i believe in vermonters 
So having grown up here and gone to school in Springfield, Vermont, and a time when innovation in our rural areas was something that was to be aspired to, I, I left, went around the country. I've worked in the uh, startup technology world for the past 20 years. And I've been able to see how amazing innovation is out there with regards to ideas that can change our communities. And what I found when I came back to Vermont was a changed economy. And I think we can do better. And so the reason why I'm running for governor is because I believe we need to shrink our government a bit, <coughs> we need to lower our taxes, and we need to take existing funds within our budget and invest it back in our communities and innovation centers. And so in order to do that, it's not something that can be done in a single two-year gubernatorial term. But it is part of a longer-term plan in order to bring prosperity back to the full state and not just certain areas of it, let alone, in my opinion, the state government should never be the largest employer in a state. Thank you. What qualifies you? My experience in business, having run companies and founded companies, as well as I, throughout my life, has been involved in volunteerism and community development. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Peyton, tell us why you're running and what qualifies you. Well, as many of you might know, that I have been in gubernatorial races before, and I actually stopped out of disgust at the state of our democracy that was not actually fully democratic. So the type of integrity that I believe we need to have in democracy is to have a fair competition with all candidates. So I'm very thankful to be here today. And there are seven of us, and that's how many should be at every debate. So I've been working for environmental justice, for economic justice, and in 2008, I became uh, quite angry at the kind of economic injustice that was happening, as long as a lifelong uh, fire in the belly about the destruction of the Earth. Uh, and to that end, I've been studying how we can use our social technology for means of exchanges so that we can effectively end the economic rat race and put people into a position where they can fulfill their life purposes with the freedom of fulfilling all the work that we need to do in, the, in these very trying and hard times. So essentially, if we continue to be uh, chained to the US dollar, working as hard as we can just to get a few dollars, we will not be able to do the work that we really must. So I bring to leadership uh, systems of economic exchange, knowledge of that. I also uh, bring an integrity that comes from being a person who has personally housed homeless people over eight winters. Ten seconds. And I will say this, we have a lot of work to do and we need to step into a new paradigm to do it. Thank you very much. Phil Scott, why are you running for re-election and what experience do you bring to the position? Well, thank you very much. 20 years ago, I didn't have a political bone in my body, I had absolutely no interest in politics whatsoever, but I was complaining a lot about what they were doing to me in Montpelier. So I stepped up, decided to be part of the solution and, uh, and haven't looked back since. I served uh, Washington County in the state Senate for 10 years. Uh, then as lieutenant governor for six years, and then I decided to run for governor because I thought Vermonters really need a break. Uh, we need to live within our means, and, and we've been doing some great work over the last two years. Uh, we didn't raise a single tax or fee uh, for the general fund. We cut income taxes by $30 million. We, we eliminated the tax on Social Security for low and moderate income Vermonters, and we prevented $71 million in increased uh, property tax rates as well. We made the single largest investment in housing Vermont has ever seen. Uh, it's going to be about $100 million when you couple that with uh, private investment. And we passed tuition-free college for National Guard members as well. So we have a lot more to do. Uh, the two-year term isn't enough. Uh, and, uh, and I look forward to, if, if, uh, if I'm reelected, to con continuing in that respect, trying to make Vermont more affordable so that Vermonters uh, can uh, live here, stay here, work here, play here and have a much more prosperous Vermont. Thank you very much. Christine Halquist, tell us why you're running and what qualifies you for the position of governor. Well, I've, I love Vermont. I, in my 42 plus years here, I've done everything from serving on the local school board, uh, chairing mental health board, 
Uh, past five years, I've been town moderator, to name a few. I have uh, a long history of leadership experience. Um, I, but I will tell you, in uh, 2004, I went to the Intergovernmental Climate Change Commission re uh, report out in Quebec City, and I realized the electric grid would be key to solving our climate change. I became CEO of Vermont Electric Cooperative, uh, the second largest utility in Vermont. It's a cooperative, just like a food co-op. Um, in 2005, it was on the verge of bankruptcy, had the highest rates in the state, highest number of outages. I pulled people together using a collaborative leadership model, hiring the best people. And uh, we, we, uh, when I left in March of this year, we were 96% carbon free. We were offering incentives for people to move away from fossil fuel heating, cooling, and transportation. And we did that without a rate increase for five years, essentially proving you can solve climate change, but it does not need to cost more money. But the events of uh, November 9, 2016 changed everything for me. Um, that's, you know, the following year I did a lot of marching. But I realized that, um, you know, seeing some uh, white supremacist activity in late 2017 and then listening to the Muslim girls making change, doing slam poetry about what it's like to live in Vermont, I decided to run for governor. And I did, you know, I, I voted for Phil Scott, but I'm highly disappointed because, you know, I, I looked when he talked about affordability. He, uh, he vetoed the minimum wage bill. He vetoed a family leave bill. He vetoed a bill to put uh, toxic in toys and uh, make polluters pay. So it looks like uh, affordability, we're not talking about the people on the lowest in rung of the income ladder. So what I'd do for Vermont is I would, I would f definitely focus on two thirds of Vermonters live in rural Vermont. I would focus on Vermont, growing Vermont's rural economy, That's connecting every, every home and business with fiber optic cable, as well as rebuilding the downtowns, continue to move to improve Medicare for all, um, ensure every child receives a quality public education and will solve climate change on the way because we can. Thank you very much. Charles Laramie. My name is Charles Laramie. I'm an independent candidate for governor. Um, I grew up in Vermont, family of 11. Um, went in the military. I served in the Navy and the Air Force, so I have leadership uh, skills from there. I uh, worked roofing for 10 years before I uh, went and taught in our public schools for 25 years. I just finished in June. And what brought me into, uh, I, I, like Mr. Scott, had never thought of running for public office. But on April 5th, I met with Mr. Scott in his office for an hour and we talked about education. And I told him education, Vermont public schools were really in dire need. Uh, that if they mentioned anymore that uh, we had the best school system in the country, it would be a lie. Um, that's continued. It is a lie. We don't have the best public school system in the country. Actually, um, all the schools are in pretty bad shape, but Vermont's also. I have ways to fix them. Uh, Mr. Scott, Ms. Holoquist, uh, they have no experience in that area and they, they don't have any idea about fixing it. Um, also, the economy they talk about. Uh, Heather Bushi uh, just wrote an article. I answered it on April 12th. She said we had Vermont has uh, currently has a strong economy and the best education system in the country. Uh, per capita incomes 25 to 30 thousand. Vermont has a terrible economy. Um, Vermonters are suffering. I got into it because I want to correct the education system uh, and fix the economy so that people can start to be able to get by without scraping by every week wondering where the next bill's coming from. And uh, that's why I got into it. Thank you very much. So we're going to now go to the question about the economy. This is an issue that some of you have raised. Just to remind folks who are watching, our number is 802-862-3966. And of course, we have a live studio audience. We love that so much. If you have any questions, please um, give them to Barry, who's sitting there with the red computer. Thank you so much. So the next question has to do with um, our economy. There are, Forbes magazine has said that our economic outlook is, present, is projected to be the second worst in the U.S. over the next five years, while income growth is expected to lag behind the rest of the country. Starting with Steve Marks, do you agree with this assessment? And what is your plan of action to, strength, to strengthen Vermont's economy, promote income growth, and generate a sustainable economy. What does sustainable mean to you? Uh, well, I, sustainable doesn't 
means that it will keep going. And, and I think, I personally think that Vermont's economy is in, in, in terrible shape. But it certainly needs improvement. And what I would like to do is, uh, there are a number of things I would like to do. I mean, we need to bring young people into Vermont. And by getting a, a constitutional amendment in Vermont, giving the earth rights, I believe that a lot of young people will move into Vermont because they believe in that. And they believe that that's, that, that will help. And I, and I feel that instead of um, giving uh, thousands of dollars for people to stay in Vermont and work on their computers at their home, which I think is a good thing, I, um, I think we need a, an apprenticeship program. We have we, most of our um, plumbers and electricians and carpenters are over 50 years old. So it would be great to have an apprenticeship program that brings people into Vermont, says if you stay in Vermont for five or seven years, you, you, will, you will not have to pay for this program. And Vermonters will, will help out by um, helping local people that, that do the apprenticeship program pay for that, because there's health insurance, there's things that they can't afford. And that's what, and that's what the, um, my local um, carpenters and plumbers have told me would help them. And um, I mean, that's just the beginning. There, there are so many things. If we, if we, if we sit down and talk together and, and figure out, there's so many little things. But, but I think the main thing is getting people um, in, in Vermont. Uh, sorry. Um. Sorry, right, you can keep going. Hold no, on. Just well, hold your mic, then we'll clip it on. Okay. Um, Just, yeah, near your mouth. <laughs> this, is, this is new to me, folks. Um, Fine. You know, I, I, I just want to tell people that I, I live in the backwoods of Vermont. I, I don't own a computer. I don't own a cell phone. Um, but, but, I lo but I love this state. I mean, it, it has just changed my whole life. Um, the people I met, I, I was a literacy teacher, and the people I met, um, by being a literacy teacher, showed me that Vermonters are amazing people. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I appreciate it. All right, Trevor Barlow, you spoke a little bit about the economy and your dissatisfaction with it in Vermont. Tell us a little bit more about what you will do to strengthen Vermont's economic outlook and what does sustainable economy mean to you? So I think we have some wonderful examples in Vermont of what a sustainable economy can be. Uh, we've obviously, in the past 20 years, um, of our history gone through one of the most significant technical transformations or technological transformations um, we've ever seen in human history. And so I think we need to leverage that as a state that has always had a history of innovation to bring that out to our rural communities. And so as a part of that, you can look at incubators that uh, particularly Chittenden County is a great example of how things are working quite well, uh, where you can grow companies like My Web Grocer, Dealer.com, and not just strictly technology, but we can get into healthcare and uh, other options where we can do things that businesses can be created in the rural areas. And so my idea for accomplishing that is that we create a venture capital type fund that is started by the state and we leverage our 12 regional development corporations that are already existing as the conduit for this. And so we give each of them a million dollars a year that we say, do what you want to improve your communities. Make that a fund with a goal of trying to find matching funds within the private community, as well as allowing, because of the new financial laws, Vermonters in those communities to invest as well. So we can start to create a virtuous cycle that we're starting to see up in Chittenden County as well. When a company does well and when the creative economy is unleashed, and people see that happening, they tend to want to reinvest in their communities for the betterment of all. And I think that is something I personally have witnessed all around the country, and there's no reason with our existing infrastructure in Vermont and with our current budget that we can't account for that type of situation here as well. Thank you very Thank much. You. M. Payton, your thoughts on the sustainability <coughs> of Vermont's economy and what you would do to move us towards that picture. Okay, there's uh, broad picture issues that, uh, as a governor, I can deal with. And one of those broad picture issues is coming up with a legal definition of greed versus abundance, financial abundance. And I believe we need that at this time. When does capitalism become destructive? And when is it an appropriate uh, healthy competition amongst businesses. Now, all the social 
technology that we need for an environmentally and sustainably just society exists for us to create an abundant mechanisms of social exchanges. So we mustn't be limited by the uh, by only using U.S. dollars to get the work done that we need to do. I, I believe that we need many more apprenticeship situations. We need a, exactly what Trevor is also talking about and probably also uh, Christine's work too. So one of the things that's marvelous about being a governor is that one can pull from the strengths that we have in our, uh, in our state to pull together and work together. Another thing we need to do is at the educative level where we are uh, educating for compliance. I'd like to remove that burden of educating for compliance, which is essentially feeding a pharmaceutical industry as children are often drugged just to comply. We need to encourage the creativity, encourage the future generations to uh, begin, even if it's experimental, to work on sustainable, just economies. Thank you. Governor Scott, what's your assessment of the health of the Vermont economy and what will you do to move us towards a sustainable economy? Well, again, this is exactly why I ran for governor. I believe that we were spending uh, more than we were taking in. Uh, we needed to, the knee-jerk reaction was always to raise a, another tax or fee. Uh, and so that made it more unaffordable uh, for people to come and stay in Vermont. We have to recognize, we have to face our challenges. We have to recognize what those challenges are. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a workforce shortage. Uh, what we, we have fewer people working today than in 2009. Uh, that's, that's an issue. Uh, we have a population that's stagnant. We have a demographic that's shifting. We're getting older. Uh, so we have fewer youth. I mean, you look at the, the canary in the, in the mine shaft here is the 30,000 fewer kids we have in our K-12 education system. That should tell us something about what's wrong with Vermont. We need more immigration. We need to attract more families into Vermont. It's not that there's a brain drain in some respects. It's that we don't have the crop coming in. So what we need to do, regardless of, of your political stripes, is to focus on the demographics, bring more people, more families into Vermont, uh, because there are jobs here. The good news is we have jobs, whether it's at Mac Molding down the southern part of the state looking for 100 people, GE Aviation looking for 100, UTC Aerospace looking for 150, <coughs> up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, we have NSA, Revision, and so forth. Everyone is looking for employees. But what we need, uh, really, is people to fill them. Uh, and that's our challenge right now. It's not as though there's no jobs, which has been a problem in the past. We have them, but we don't have the people to fill them. So we need to continue. Uh, to Businesses want certainty. We need to make sure that we, we give them that. Vermonters need certainty. <coughs> we, we need to make sure we're on a, a charted course ahead that they can see. Uh, we need to grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, and protect the most vulnerable. And if we adhere to those principles, work on workforce development, bringing more families in, making it more affordable, we'll have a much more prosperous Vermont. Thank you very much. Christine Halquist, what's your assessment of the Vermont economy and what's your plan of action? Well, I'm not going to make any judgment on the Forbes article and what they say about the Vermont economy. But I do know I've spent 10 years on a, com on a technical advisory committee at the national level uh, that looked at all of rural America. The problems we're seeing in rural Vermont are a microcosm of what's cap happening in rural America. We're seeing increasing rates of poverty, flights to the city, and an aging demographic. The same thing happened in the 1930s when the cities had electricity and rural America did not. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when, and so when we connected every home and business with electricity, we saw growth return to rural America. Today we're facing the digital divide. Uh, that's why it's so important to get every home and business connected with fiber. Young people and entrepreneurs aren't going to come to Vermont if they can't get connected. You know, if you look at connectivity today, it's, it's as important as road, sewer, water, and electricity for development. So, and it's got to be fiber. Our copper infrastructure is wholly inadequate for competing uh, with, with the urban areas today. And I also will work to rebuild the downtown, similar to, you know, if you see what's happened in White River Junction, St. Albans, uh, using the tax increment financing model. We've rebuilt downtowns. Uh, so I envision a Vermont where, you know, we've got entrepreneurs and uh, young people who are able to, to work in their homes 
and come to their communities and go and, and ha we'll have shared working spaces similar to what I just saw get commissioned in Bradford for about this, this Saturday. Um, we, you know, shared working spaces where people can share ideas, congregate, and uh, meet and use, use uh, teleconference facilities. I'm very bullish about Vermont. Um, you know, we're the safest state. We do have the highest education performance. We're the healthiest state. We've, we're an amazing state with amazing views. We've got an incredible outdoor recreation economy. Um, once you get people connected, we will, we will grow Vermont. And it's very important. I tell the folks in Chittenden County, Ten seconds. we grow rural Vermont, it's going to benefit everybody because we'll have more resources. A good business person knows you've got to have a way to grow things. And that's the way we're going to grow Vermont. Thank you very much. Charles Laramie, what's your assessment of the Vermont economy and what will you do to promote income growth and a sustainable economy? Well, I, I'm going to go back to education a lot because that's, uh, you know, I taught for 25 years. And uh, our current, uh, your current education system is going to reflect your future economy. And currently, based on that, our future economy is in, in deep trouble. Um, in the 1980s, I was making 10 or $11 an hour, 1989. That was good money because consumer prices were comparable. Today, people are making maybe a couple dollars more an hour. Consumer prices have skyrocketed. And uh, a lot of small businesses, companies want to, want to tell you that, uh, you know, they can't raise the livable wage because then they would have to raise the prices. But they don't have to raise the prices. Profits have been shooting up. We need a $15 an hour livable wage. I've argued this with some small business owners. Uh, Mr. Scott, because he's a Republican, his party says he can't do that. Uh, Ms. Holloquist, she's going to do that because the Democratic Party says to do that. Uh, she's also going to uh, institute a carbon tax, which is going to take care of the $15 minimum wage because that's going to chew that up. Um, what we need to do is introduce a $15 livable wage, uh, start to fix our education system so kids coming out have the skills to take the jobs, Mr. Scott says, excuse me, that are out there. And uh, th this is a big thing. I talked to a gentleman who said, uh, don't forget the manufacturing jobs that Vermont has already, wood, wood manufacturing jobs that we can do. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I've talked to M. Payton about uh, producing hemp and legalizing marijuana and the businesses that will come from that. And these are all things that we have to look at. The, uh, You're done. Thank you very much. You Chris Erickson, tell us your assessment of the Vermont economy and what you would do to promote sustainability. All right. We've got to make all colleges and universities free for the students. Where are you going to get the money for that? We have to have a fund, part of the general fund, has to be something that people can apply to to start a new business. People have to be able to say, I've got a great idea, I just need the money to start a new business. Now to accomplish those two goals with zero tax increase, we have to go back to my first plan. If I'm elected governor of Vermont, I hold a conference of all governors of all states and say, look, I'm going to get us all, all money. We're going to get ROI, return on investment of federal taxpayer dollars. I'll run it by you again. We pay our federal taxes. The federal government allows the United States Congress to give billions of dollars to the National Institute of Health. The United States Congress gives billions of dollars to the Pentagon. The Pentagon and the NIH give millions to each pharmaceutical company and defense contractor. They make copyrights, which we have a legal right to, ownership of, because under work made for hire laws, we own a fair share of those copyrights, therefore we own the patents, and we have a right to a share of the profits. They're making trillions and trillions of dollars selling prescription drugs worldwide. They're making trillions of dollars selling defense products worldwide. We have a right to 50% of that ROI, return on investment of federal taxpayer dollars, divided up among the 50 states, and you can make free college, and you can have investment funds in every single state for people to apply to, to start new businesses. When you say Vermont's sitting on a gold mine, come here, show us your new business plan, lots of people will come to Vermont. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
All right, we have some questions from the audience. Just reminding our viewers, 802-862-3966. We are very happy to hear from you. And let's um, start with Trevor with this question. How will you protect the most vulnerable considering the attacks coming from the federal, le federal level, federal government? Well, without knowing specifically what attacks we're talking about from the federal government with can regards you, to the... Can you speculate what they might be? Uh, speculate. I guess, I guess in general, the way I would take care of the most vulnerable is my, my experience tells me that the fastest way to take care of a problem is closest to the problem, and that's by empowering our local communities to once again uh, be able to sustain themselves and have services. Uh, that where they can go out and help. And I think there's a variety of issues that that brings up when it comes to uh, employment, housing, health care, education, uh, and knowing the time limits. I can't go into details, I think, with regards to each of those subjects. But in general, I think all of us as human beings know that we should be doing a better job of taking care of the less fortunate. And I personally fall on the side of innovation as being the best way to take care of that, where if you empower your communities to find creative solutions to problems that are unique to them, then you're also going to get your, your best outcomes. Thank you very Thank much. You. And Peyton, how will you protect the most vulnerable considering the attacks coming from the federal government? Well, one of the reasons why I'm standing for governor is because I've been looking for a stronger backbone coming from the leadership of our state, uh, where we have families that have been separated at the border. I'm looking for a leader that will stand up and say, that isn't who we are, and Vermont will not stand for it, and we will not continue to support any federal activity on that level. Also, that we are currently in war, at war with seven countries, dropping 144 bombs a day, and we're not even declared war, and our, our children are coming back with eight times higher amount of suicide rate. We have uh, changed from being a land of the opportunity to incarceration nation. This is a huge problem we haven't been talking about much on this campaign trail, but we need to stop having incarceration as a method to provide profit for private industry. We also need, of course, to empower the next generations to be as creative. Now, Chris eloquently described the way we can uh, justify a universal basic div dividend. A universal basic dividend is so important so that we can begin to have the freedom to do everything that's in our heart that we know is possible and that must be done. So uh, as, a, as a governor, there's many things I can do to speak to the crimes against humanity that are coming out of Washington, climate change being one of them. Is there more time? 10 seconds. So I ask for your vote and I ask for your support to make a profound change in democracy where all your choices are the choices that you have to choose from in government. On the money, thank you very much. Governor Scott, what will you do to protect the most vulnerable considering the attacks coming from the federal level? Well, we have a moral obligation to, to take care of the most vulnerable, and that's something that we pledge to do. I think we're, uh, it's part of our DNA in, uh, in Vermont. I think that's something that we uh, hold near and dear to our hearts. Uh, we're, we're very compassionate very giving in many, many different ways. Um, we, um, we're independent by nature, as I said. Um, we're fortunate in some respects. We've set ourselves up pretty well in Vermont uh, with Medicaid having the global commitment uh, that was put into place, I think, during the Douglas administration and, and improved upon during the Shumlin administration. So that's given us some flexibility and latitude to take care of the most vulnerable, about 200,000 people on that, uh, in that program in Vermont. Uh, we're moving towards an all-payer model, uh, again, giving us more flexibility uh, in terms of health care. Uh, that's something that the, is a, somewhat of a, a pilot project uh, that the federal government's wa watching what we're doing. That could be helpful. But the elephant in the room, obviously, is uh, about the pushback with, uh, with the president, some of the initiatives. Uh, but we took action when, uh, when there's a push uh, against uh, immigration. Uh, we passed S-79 with a tripartisan support, mm. Pro uh, progressives, Democrats, Republicans coming together to do that. Uh, push back against o Obamacare, the, the uh, elimination repeal of that. 
uh, as well, oppose the transgender ban uh, for the military. Uh, we, I oppose the withdrawal from the Paris uh, Accord, uh, and we joined the U.S. Climate Alliance as well, uh, to, again, showing our independence. I've opposed the EPA budget cuts. I just call them as I see them. Uh, I've spoke out against uh, the, uh, the potential of not having a, 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 a NAFTA uh, agreement uh, with Canada. Uh, our largest trading partner it would have been detrimental uh, to our economy. But we're through that. And again, there's been uh, talk about potential cuts uh, to Planned Parenthood, which I've opposed as well. So we'll continue, I'll continue uh, to push back, call them as I see them. And uh, when it's wrong, we'll stand up to it. We, we're being sued today uh, by uh, uh, some of the uh, large, uh, large uh, telecommunications groups uh, in terms of net neutrality. Uh, we passed that bill. I had an executive order as well. Okay. And we're being sued as a result. Thank you very much. Awesome. Christine Halquist, what will you do to protect the most vulnerable in our state? Well, you know, if you, if you look at where we are today in terms of health care and a living wage, um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, first of all, uh, making a profit off of people sick and dying is, is not, not the way we should, we should be running our health care system. We're the only uh, developed nation in, in, in the world that does this. Um, so I will, con I will push hard to get us to Medicare for all. Um, the United States spends uh, 18 cents of every uh, gross domestic product dollar on health care. The European countries spent eight to nine cents, and they provide death health care for everybody. Um, we also spend 31 cents of every dollar uh, in health care for administration in our state. Uh, Medicare is five, five cents. So I'm absolutely committed to move us to Medicare for all. And we can immediately put in a universal primary care bill. I've done the numbers on universal primary care. Um, it, for the, for the, the little increase that it costs uh, to employers um, after the savings from not having to provide primary care, it more than pays for itself because people are going to the doctor right away. So also I will point out that the minimum wage if adjusted for inflation since the 1960s would be $22 an hour right now. Um, that's why I would immediately ask the legislature to bring the increase in the minimum wage bill back. Um, when I ask uh, uh, people in housing partnerships and, and folks in construction, what does it cost to live in a two-bedroom unit in Vermont? It's $22 an hour. So basically, if you're not making a living wage, we have to make investments in housing. Today, with the $35 million that, 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 that uh, spawned $65 million in bonding, that meets about 20% of our need. We need to significantly make more investments in housing, um, and also when it comes to uh, protecting the most vulnerable. I'll also be very supportive in terms of uh, ending racism and, and addressing marginalized communities in school, uh, having an independent from the governor third-party commission uh, to look at the, the, uh, the data and policing, schooling, and uh, and employment in terms of how discipline is applied by marginalized computers, as well as address the uh, substance use disorder issues. Thank you. It's difficult to answer these complex questions in two minutes, I understand, yeah. but everyone's giving it a good go, so <laughs> thank you very much. Charles Laramie, your view on how to protect the most vulnerable in the state considering the federal threats. The uh, taking care of the most vulnerable, of course, comes at a, uh, this is kind of a serious time to take a look because we look outside and, you know, tonight it's going to be 29 degrees and we have a lot of people who are going to be living on the street. And, you know, how do we go about taking care of those people? And, and one of the way, of course, is affordable housing, coming up with it. But also what we need to do when you have uh, people who are living on the street, we have to go out to them. So, and, and that's not easy. A lot of those people, they're, they're uh, cautious about being approached by people. They're, they're nervous because they've been in homeless shelters. Uh, you know, they're not trusting of that. They wonder what's gonna happen to them. So we need, uh, we need people who can go out, even police officers sometimes, to try and uh, help these people gain their trust, get them into some affordable housing that they can, that they can live in and you know, some of, uh, of course, a lot of these people are alcoholics, they're addicts. How, how are we going to help them then at that point? And, uh, it, and it's difficult because, uh, you know, I know I was talking to some people up here in Burlington in a, in a two-bedroom apartment that's not even a great one is, you know, $1,350 a month, and that's $700 they said they had to spend for parking. So these are all difficult things. 
but those are things that we have to start to undertake with, with, uh, with these people to help them. The, the best way to help uh, those who are vulnerable is to give them the skills to take care of themselves. And this is what we need to do as a state to, uh, to get these people back on their feet. Thank you very much. Chris Erickson. All right, everyone's ideas cost money. So number one, voters are always asking me, where are you going to get the money to do this? Where are you going to get the money to do that? And again, it's ROI, return on investment of taxpayer dollars, where we are getting cheated. The pharmaceutical companies and the defense contractors who are using our taxpayer dollars to make trillions of dollars for them are screwing us over because we have a right to a share of the profit. Now, if you're a well-to-do person and you can afford to buy stock on the stock market, you expect ROI, return on investment. You expect to get a dividend. But who's really paying their dividend? We are. The poor people and the hard workers of Vermont have their taxes gouged out of their paycheck. They go to Washington, D.C., United States Congress votes to give them to the NIH and to the Pentagon. They decide to give them to the pharmaceutical companies and the defense contractors. They make trillions of dollars and they pay their people who own shares in their company dividends. So our taxpayer dollars are being given to the people who own shares of, shares of stock in those companies as dividends. We're getting screwed royally. I'm going to call a conference of all governors of all states and put a stop to this. When we put a stop to this, we're going to demand our share, our fair share of profit. We put money into these companies. We, de we deserve ROI, a return on our investment. We deserve a fair share of the profit, and that's going to pay for all of these programs that everybody's thinking of. Thank you. My name's Chris Erickson. Please vote for me. Thank you very much. Steve Marks. I was a literacy teacher for 20 years with adult basic education in, in my area in Stratford and Thetford and West Fairley and Verschier and Tunbridge and Chelsea. And what I found out was that there were a lot of people who were, who were very vulnerable. And if, if you get somebody in their home to help them, to, exp to show them what they need, it can, it can change their whole lives. Um, you, you can stop child abuse or you can certainly change child abuse. You can, you can get people to understand different things. So, so I think that a, as a state, we should be looking into our social services, not going out and really working with people. Um, I th and I think we need more social service people. We, and we, we certainly need more therapists. And, and um, I have a plan that we should get the colleges that, that have um, those programs, like UVM, to um, say the, the state of Vermont will pay for your college if you stay in state for seven to ten years. And at the end, at, and I think most of those people, once they're in Vermont, will stay in Vermont. But all those people will help with opium addiction, with, um, you know, w with, with all the problems that we have. And um, also that they're, I, I, you know, when we talk about vulnerable people, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, in, in helping people to create their own reality. Uh, I mean, I believe we create our own reality. So I, I've worked with people, and I remember one, one family where that I did budgeting with them, and I showed them that if they, if they could stop doing things like one case of beer a month and stop smoking one pack of cigarettes a week, they wouldn't lose their house. But they couldn't do that. But I wasn't a social worker. I couldn't get them to change. So I really feel that we need to get people in there to help people on a one-to-one on -one basis. All right, thank you very much. I'm just gonna remind folks, you can give us a call at 862-3966, that's 802-862-3966. Um, we're gonna go to the question, what will you do to dismantle systemic and institutional racism in Vermont? And we will start with M. Payton. Hmm. Well, first of all, we ought not, to, I would stop sending any body out of state to prison, work on an entirely restorative model for justice, and again, to help us understand that the cultural nourishment that we get from 
people of different cultures is, is so important to our understanding of the variety of expressions of human <coughs> culture that there are. Again, we gotta go back to an economic standpoint where we aren't in fear that somebody's gonna take work from somebody else or somebody's, a, and we cannot tax ourselves to get there and we cannot go into debt to get there. So we've heard from candidates about the justification and how we would justify a universal basic dividend. So I wanna also discuss a couple of other uh, options that we have that are working within the current US dollar system. One, we have a Vermont public bank so that our taxes go into the Vermont public bank and our money stays in state and supports loans going through local banks. We have a Vermont credit card. We'd have many tourists having a Vermont credit card. Again, the fees for a credit card will go into the treasury. We have make a, a system of simplified self-directed IRAs so the people who do have money to invest in Vermont know how to do it. Then we start thinking about moving outside the limitations of the dollar system and there's absolutely no reason that we should be limited by a US dollar system. Then we get into a complementary currency, we get into a work exchange system, we get into how do we create community. So coming back to how do we uh, eradicate racism, we begin with some economic justice. Okay, thank you very much. Governor Scott, what will you do to eradicate um, institutional, or dismantle, I think is the word, systemic and institutional racism in Vermont? Well, Vermont is a very special place. Uh, we're known for our compassion, the way we treat each other. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, we have to accept the reality and understand that we're not immune uh, from racism and bias here in Vermont. Uh, and it's disappointing, to say the least. Uh, we look at Kaya Morris, a representative uh, from Bennington, uh, who decided not to, to uh, serve, not to, uh, to, to uh, she in fact resigned, uh, and decided not to uh, run for re-election uh, because of the, the racial slurs her and her family had to endure. And it's just simply unacceptable. I, I called her and, uh, and told her, even though you know we're 180 degrees apart, uh, in terms of our, our political uh, affiliation and outlook and, and views. Uh, but I told her uh, that if she would reconsider, that I would support her publicly because I think it's important not to let them win. And so we have to support each other in doing that. We also had the, uh, uh, the PAC family camp in Stowe uh, where a group uh, was in, in Stowe uh, at a retreat or camp and, uh, and they were subjected to racial slurs as well. Uh, and again, this is not uh, becoming of being a Vermonter. Uh, we desperately need more diversity in this state. Uh, I've talked about the workforce challenges we have. We need more people here. Uh, and it's clear that we have much more to work to, uh, work to do to become a more welcoming place. I signed the racial equity bill, uh, which will identify and, and offer solutions uh, to address uh, this <coughs> systemic uh, uh, racism that we're, we're suffering from. Uh, and, but it's a basic, we need more civility, we need more respect uh, and bullying and so forth in our schools and throughout. Uh, and, and I'm sure that we'll hear more about that in our schools. We, we need more refugees uh, as well. We need to be more welcoming. I reached out to the, the White House after they reduced the number of refugees that they were going to uh, to allow in the states and I asked them to consider uh, putting Vermont on the top of the list uh, because we've been successful in this area in doing so. So I think it's about us uh, treating each other with more respect and civility and also be becoming more welcoming and, and following through on each and every uh, endeavor. Thank you very much. Christine Halquist, how, what will you do to dismantle systemic and institutional racism in Vermont? Well, you know, um, after November 9, 2016, I went into political depression. And uh, in 2017, I did a lot of marching. I marched in Washington, the Women's March, the Climate March. I did a lot of marching in Vermont. But I was a bit in denial because um, what, when I, what hap in, I thought we would be protected from these, these headwinds of bigotry and racism that were coming out of Washington. But in late 2017, we started to see white supremacist activity in Vermont. And then on January 20th, 2018, I was down at the Youth March in Montpelier, and I listened to those four 
young woman, high school seniors, Muslim girls making change. Talk about the harassment they see in their schools and community. And that's when I cried, and that's when I decided to run for governor. Um, now, there's, uh, what I'm committed to do in terms of to, uh, dealing with institutional racism is, first of all, I'm committed to have people, on color, people of color on my transition team and on, in my administrative team. I'm committed to take the, in, this, uh, have an independent commission um, that oversees the data in terms of uh, policing schools and employment and how discipline is applied and how, and how growth opportunity occurs. And I'm committed to increasing the diversity of Vermont altogether. I do believe Vermont's a loving and welcoming place, but I, but I do think we need to do, uh, be very active in, in, in uh, recruiting people of color to come here. I would target our tourist dollars to people of color. Um, and I know that you know, people who visit here sometimes live here. Um, and so I would take very active process. Um, and I also will form a union of states. I, 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 there are many states that, that, want, that, are, that are very upset with what's happening out of Washington. Uh, and I would take an active role as a governor to organize those states to push back on some of these, uh, these policies that are coming out of, out of Washington. At, and I would ensure to use that, that union to protect immigrants and migrant rights. Thank you very much. Charles Laramie, what will you do to dismantle systemic and institutional racism in our state? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, you know, no, nobody uh, is born hating somebody because of, uh, you know, the uh, shape of their eyes or the color of their skin. Uh, kids play together when they're four or five. They have no understanding of uh, such a thing. They just like playing together, and that's all it matters. So obviously racism is something we learn and we learn it from generally speaking our family. So racism and fixing is about education and as a teacher of 25 years in Vermont schools to say uh, I don't see racism in our school would be a lie. I mean I, I hear it all the time walking in the hallways. I hear how kids talk. Um, it's blatant racism a lot of times things they're saying. And, it, and it's disturbing to hear it. But I grew up in Vermont and uh, in the 60s and 70s, and it was very common to hear those uh, jokes and things, and, and you never thought about them. And I uh, went in the military, and when I went to boot camp in Chicago, uh, it was quite a culture shock for me to walk in and live with 80 guys of uh, varying uh, ethnic groups and you learned and then I traveled all over the world and now I have friends in Jordan and China and and uh, Japan and different places and and you know racism is about fear you fear somebody and this is what causes it and we fear things in Vermont uh, you know I grew up here I don't find Vermont that welcoming and wonderful place all the time uh, people in Vermont aren't always that welcoming they're kind of standoffish and uh, if you have to approach them, they'll, they'll help you out, but they don't always go out of their way. So this idea that Vermonters are always open, you know, there's a lot of states like that. So education is what we need to do. We need to teach people that uh, everybody's the same. We all have the same hopes, dreams, wants, doesn't matter. Thank you very much. Yeah. Chris Erickson, your approach to dismantling systemic racism. All right, I have a great idea. And again, people say to me, every time I bring up one of my great ideas, they say, well, how are you going to pay for that, Chris? Well, it all gets back to the ROI, return on investment of our federal taxpayer dollars that are going to the defense contractors, the pharmaceutical companies. They're making trillions of dollars. We have a right to to half of those trillions of dollars they're making. We have a right to return on investment. What I'm going to do if I'm elected governor is approach all 40,000 homeless United States military veterans. Now there are a lot of nonprofits that are taking care of some of the homeless military veterans on any night, but on an, any given night in the United States of America there are 40,000 homeless U.S. military veterans, and some of these are women. A lot of them have a pension. A lot of them might qualify for SSI. I'm going to invite them all to Vermont, but guess what? Are you really prepared? Because half of them are black and Latino people of color. Is Vermont really ready to have 20,000 U.S. military veterans 
who are black or Latino, think about it, because I will bring them here and I will find housing for them. I will get a return on investment from federal taxpayer dollars. And until I get that, I will have Vermont prisoners. We've got 1,200 prisoners in the state. I will hire people to teach those prisoners how to build log cabins. I will use some of Vermont's land. We've got big forest. I will have them, the prisoners building log cabins Ten and seconds. we'll put solar panels on the roofs for electricity and I will bring 40,000 homeless U.S. military veterans to Vermont. Now start thinking about it. A lot of them have pensions or they, or they qualify for SSI. Five. So that's 40,000 people. That ends up being $40 million a month into the economy of Vermont. $40 million a month of their SSI or their pensions coming into the economy of Vermont. Thank you. Vote for me, Chris Erickson. Thank you very much. Steve Marks, your approach to eradicating institutional racism in Education, Vermont. education, education. And not just educating kids, but educating the police force, um, getting, um, oh, there's, there, there, you know, I, I was born in New York City and I went to a high school that was, um, 50% people of color and, and what I found was that my best friends were people of color and, and so for me it's really hard not to fathom how you can't and then I went into the army and it was amazing to me how, how wonderful everybody is. I mean we are an amazing group of individuals um, and, and but a lot of people are not, they're not taught what, 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 it, what they should learn. They, they're, they're taught to hate, and, and hatred is the worst, for me, is, is the worst thing. So, so we need to get, get rid of that. We need, and the way to do that is to educate. And, and, and I also believe that we, we really need to bring back our prisoners, and we need to educate them, and we need to find them jobs, because, because that will bring us all together. Thank you very much. Trevor Barlow, your view on eradicating institutional racism in Vermont. I agree with uh, everyone on the panel so far who has talked about education as being of the utmost importance and I think it gets directed towards where you start it. And I think it gets into our schools and curriculums where we have to have a mandatory multicultural curriculum. I know myself from having grown up in Vermont and uh, in Springfield, when I grew up there, it was a, a fairly homogenous society. And the irony is, is Vermont is still somewhat homogenous um, compared to the rest of the country. But the minute I was able to leave the state and travel, my eyes were opened as far as uh, multicultural opportunity as I was able to engage in. And I've lived in urban areas similar to some of the commentary uh, tonight. And there's a different ethos. And I think it just is an intent of a community is you have to decide that diversity is something that you seek because it's the benefit of your community and as such you will not tolerate discrimination and I think that brings about the change within the governmental aspects of how we we manage ourselves as a society um, to eradicate this type of behavior but ultimately you have the leadership of the governor that says it's unacceptable, which I think everyone on the panel agrees, which is a beautiful thing about our state. But then there's the second part of it is how do you make your um, population more diverse to reflect that initiative? And personally, I come at it from the perspective of innovation, because I think if you approach our small towns and rural communities and you say, we're going to give you an opportunity to build a beautiful lifestyle that is diverse and is rich in ideas and solutions, that will help to attract a more diverse population to our state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're going to take up the question of water quality in Vermont, and so everyone's going to have an opportunity to answer that. And um, But while you're thinking in your mind, while other people are answering, I want you to all to come up with a question that you have for another candidate, because that'll be our next round. So um, here's the question. We start with Governor Scott. Um, if elected, how do you plan on dealing with the current pollution issues in Lake Champlain? And we would expand that to say the water quality throughout the state. Well, we're actually doing it. Uh, over the last, we have uh, fiscal year 18 <coughs> and 19, we're spending 70% more than we have in, in previous years. Uh, right now, we have about uh, $56 million uh, that we're, we have implemented. 
uh, for water quality. Uh, I'm committed uh, to this, uh, to seeing this through. Uh, it's a long-term plan. It didn't happen overnight. It's something that's not going to, to be fixed overnight either. So we're in it for the long haul. Uh, we also uh, introduce uh, some, some unique, interesting ideas, thinking outside the box. We have what's called the phosphorus challenge. Uh, where it's almost like a reverse pitch, uh, like a shark tank, uh, where we ask companies and, and entities and entrepreneurs uh, to come up with solutions uh, for phosphorus. How can we control it uh, before it hits the ground, so to speak, or before it hits our waterways? We were pleasantly surprised. We had 27 uh, uh, people that, uh, that came forward, entities uh, with, with solutions. We've narrowed that down uh, to about a, a, a eight or 10 uh, and they're viable, uh, so we're moving forward with that. Uh, but we also, uh, you know, we've we've implemented uh, the. Everybody asks, how are we going to pay for it? Uh, we've uh, we uh, put forward the uh, property tax. Uh, uh, transfer tax uh, as a portion of that is going towards water quality. I'm not giving up on the TDI line going through Lake Champlain, uh, the conduit there. That will give us a substantial amount of money every year uh, for water quality uh, to bring uh, hydropower, uh, renewable power to, uh, to uh, Boston and, and the metropolitan areas in, to the south of us. Um, and we're, uh, we're going to continue uh, the municipal water, uh, wastewater, storm water, Infrastructure, the a &R grants that we've uh, we're doing, uh, the uh, the infrastructure as well throughout uh, the state uh, stormwater infrastructure throughout. Okay. So we uh, we're committed to doing this. I'm committed to doing this, and uh, and we'll we'll see it through. I mean, we're I think we, if we all pull in the same direction, uh, we'll have positive results. Can I just ask you a question without advocating for it? What's the TDI line? Uh, TDI line is uh, where it's a conduit that's uh, been all approved. Uh, it's fully permitted. Uh, and it's a company that's going to bring power uh, from uh, Canada, uh, energy-rich uh, Quebec, uh, through Lake Champlain, come through Ludlow to a switching station going uh, to uh, Massachusetts. Now, uh, they turned us down to begin with, but, but TDI is the name of a company that has already put this into place. It's all ready to go. We just need somebody to, uh, uh, to hook up with that. All right, thank you very much. Christine Hellquist, I'm sure you know what the TDI line is. Yes, I is. do, and I will tell you that that was the third option. The first option was Northern Pass. The second option was uh, 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 opening the path to the Northeast Kingdom. So I wouldn't put any real stake in the fact that that TDI line is going to get constructed. In fact, I would say it's probably not going to get constructed. Um, but to the question of water quality. Yeah, to the question of water quality. I use that because <coughs> it really gets to what's the funding mechanism. Um, you know, I, I, you know, Beth Pierce, our state treasurer, has done a great job um, in terms of um, uh, writing, of, of putting a plan together of, of what it's needed to fund that plan. It, it requires $25 million a year. Uh, so we really need to come, come up, I'm committed to come up with sustainable funding for that plan. Um, this is a strategic investment. You know, every dollar we invest saves three over the long term. 94% of our waterways are impacted in Vermont. Um, the, you know, this plan uh, 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 deals with, with the farm runoff, it deals with the impervious surface issues, and importantly, you know, if we look at sewer systems through our state, we have this combined, um, su combined sewer overflow that happens during storms. We have aging uh, sewing system, sewage system all throughout our state. Um, so th we, I, w I would, f that, and, and, and the funding mechanisms are addressed in that plan as well. So we do need to, absolutely need to fund that plan because I will tell you, when it, I'm also, you know, I think rural economic development is one of the most important things we can do. And our water resources are precious resources that help attract people to this state. Um, so, and, and I'm also committed to, uh, you know, help, help dairy farmers um, be, be able to have other, other funding sources that, and, and be able to help people move away from dairy uh, because, you know, that is an energy intensive crop. Um, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm committed to solve the water quality problems. I'm committed to make the investments. It's a crit strategic investment we have to make for our future, um, and and we we need to find the resources to do that. And those plan those resources are addressed in the plan. Thank you very much, Charles Laramie. Your view on water quality and what we can do to improve. Well, I quality. think what uh, Governor Scott and Ms. Holquist both stated is that we need to uh, continue to fix our in infrastructure and, uh, you know, our sewer systems and things like that. And, and generally speaking, like in the town I live in, we have a budget every 
year and you know so much is budgeted for you know they're going to need a new fire truck down the road how much are we going to budget for that and and the same can be done for uh for town sewer systems things for overflow and water and then uh on the other hand you know i decided i was going to run based on uh what's best for the Vermont people in common sense. Those are the things I have to answer to. And uh, before anybody gets really frightened, what I want you to understand, when I was growing up, uh, we didn't have water treatment plants. We didn't have uh, sewer systems. And everything just went into the river, right? And that was human waste, uh, garbage. We had open dumps. Everything was just thrown over the side. Uh, it was covered over with dirt. The, these are the things that we grew up with, and uh, we don't have those anymore. The water quality is better. Uh, when you scuba dive in the lakes, you still see the uh, pipes that come out from the cottages because that's all they did. They just flushed the toilet, went in the lake. And so these are the things we had. And those things have all been stopped. So a lot of times we hear about, uh, you know, what can we do? What can we do? More money. We've already done a lot of those things. The water quality today is a lot better than it was when I was growing up. We had open burn pits all the time in my town. Anybody could burn their garbage, tires. There was no laws against that. And people did it all the time. Couldn't even stand the air. And today, that's not the way it is. So uh, a lot has changed already. And so just don't be thinking. Uh, we got to constantly spend money to fix things. It's not always necessary. Thank you. All right, thank you. Chris Erickson, your view on maintaining the quality of our lakes and rivers. All right, first of all, if I'm elected governor of Vermont, we've got 1,200 prisoners. I'm not going to have them twiddling their thumbs in prisons in Vermont. I'm going to have every single one of them who's intellectually capable learn how to build rowboats and build oars. We got plenty of trees. My father used to build his own rowboats when I was a kid. No problem. And then we put them out in the summer. That's what they're going to do all winter. They're going to build their own rowboats and oars out of Vermont trees. In the summer, they're going to go out on every lake, Lake Champlain, and every pond, and every lake in Vermont, and they're going to pull the mill foil by hand. And then they're going to put out their fishing lines, and they're going to reel in those invasive eels, those, those ugly eels that bite fish and latch onto them. They're going to reel those suckers in. And they're going to spend all summer long cleaning up the lakes and ponds by hand. No chemicals. When my mother was alive, God bless her soul, she used to preach. She did a lot of research on the invasive chemicals that are dumped in Lake Champlain to treat the invasive species. The invasive chemicals are causing health problems. We've got dozens of sewage treatment plants all around Lake Champlain in Vermont, New York, and Canada. They're dumping treated sewage in the lake. We've got to put a U-turn on those pipes. Put a U-turn on those pipes and pump the treated sewage to either industrial use or find a use for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Steve Marks, Earth First. Well, you're not Earth First. You're Earth. Remind right. us of your party name. <laughs> Earth Rights. Earth Rights, okay. <laughs> so that's d different, but obviously this is a subject close to your heart. Well, one of the things um, that I would do um, is I, I would, I would make, make companies pay for the poisons that they put on the Earth. And um, it, it's very easy to think about it. You know, w we sell herbicides and pesticides and even plastic bags. What happens is that we sell them so that companies can make money. So they figure out how much they can charge for that bag, but they don't, they don't figure out what, it's gonna, what that bag or what that pesticide is gonna do to the earth. So, so my plan is let's charge them. You know, if, if, let's say we charge 10 cents a, a plastic bag, then all of a sudden paper bags are are, are profitable. So then we have things that can be composted. That's just one little example. There's, there's, there's so many ways, but, but, the, but the key is that, that we, the taxpayers, pay for all this poison, that the companies that make it don't pay. And we need to switch that. And then if we do that, we will have enough money to clean up the earth. 
Thank you very much. Trevor Barlow, your approach to cleaning our lakes and streams of pollution and toxins. Well, I'll... Uh, for it. Uh, thank you. I, I would say along my general beliefs in uh, leveraging innovation and technology, uh, one with regards to doing a better job of tracking sources, because that always uh, becomes one of the most difficult issues. You have an end result of pollution, but you don't always know what the source is. And we know we've had a variety of issues over the past couple of years that have come to light with PFOA, with regards to Lake Champlain and algae, and uh, various other issues. So I think in general, there are technologies out there that we can invest in to help improve our water supply. But I would also like to say, I, I agree with uh, Stephen's point of view with regards to getting into how do we manage our economy with regards to our natural resources? And how do we do a better job of accounting for the actual impacts so we make sure we have more visibility on what the costs are in order to provide for that? So in a nutshell, we know that water is the most important resource we have on this earth just because of who we are as humans and what we're made up of chemically. Uh, any issues with water need to be addressed immediately. We don't want to find ourselves in a situation like um, unfortunately happened up in Flint, Michigan, where you have people after 10 or 15 years of neglect finding out that they have terrible illnesses or impacts on their bodies um, because of a lack of action. And so ultimately water, as far as natural resources, should have our highest priority with regards to investment and solutions. Thank you very much. M. Peyton, your approach to water quality and funding. Uh, yes, so of course, uh, water is uh, the most important resource we have. And um, I hope I get a chance to talk about the role of hemp in protecting and making buffers. Um, but I also wanna talk about uh, the cost of, 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 of fracking, the big cost of fracking, and I believe we are, we're, we are importing fracked gas across the border. Uh, we have such a profound change to make in our behaviors because we have 12 years to make them. And we, can, we maybe have to figure out, since money is a uh, First Amendment right, according to the Supreme Court, Maybe we need to step outside the U.S. dollar to make them happen. Some of the things I'm concerned about is uh, the chemtrails, the, uh, the amount of poison that we're putting on. Uh, you go in, you can actually buy uh, a can of Roundup. And, and, and Roundup is, uses the same chemicals that they use in Agent Orange. So we, we need to incentivize, educate, and change our behaviors. It's absolutely absurd that we're going to bathroom in our clean water. We need to be moving to comp composting systems across the board. These are the kinds of profound societal behavioral changes that we need to be prepared to make in order to meet climate change. And you can, we can make fun of it, but we need to do it. We need to go to a zero waste system. Down in Brattleboro, They've uh, mandatorily banned all plastic bags. We need to do that statewide. They're charging for every paper bag. That needs to happen. There's so much work that we need to do in order to meet the challenge that we have ahead of us. And we just must have the money to do it. We have the will, and we will do it. Thank you very much. All right, so here's the lightning round. If you have a question for one of your candidates, for one of the fellow candidates, now is a great time to ask that. And I'm going to start with Christine Halquist. If you have a question for any of the fellow candidates, you feel free to pass if you don't have a question, but now's a good time to ask. Bill, uh, you've actually, you've talked about the water plan and you said you have a plan for how to pay for it. Um, and you've kept that plan secret. Um, <laughs> would, would you be willing to, uh, Tell us what your, what your water funding plan is. Uh, it's an existing source. I, I've said all along that uh, we don't need another knee-jerk reaction. Every, every problem that needs to be solved seems to have been uh, just uh, let's raise another tax. Uh, and that's what we've been doing over the last 10, 15, 20 years since led us to the position we're in today. 
Uh, so I've found uh, a couple of uh, existing uh, tax sources uh, that I think could be leveraged and used uh, for this purpose over the long term. As we know, during a campaign season like this, uh, if you put anything out, uh, it's it's like a team sport, and and at that point uh, it will be uh, it will be discounted uh, and rejected out of hand. I've I've been through it. I've seen it. And, and this is too important. And I believe that what we need to do is have a, a good discussion about it, uh, a good open discussion uh, in the legislative process. And uh, and so from that standpoint, I'm I'm uh, I'm committed to water quality, committed to cleaning it up. Uh, this funding source uh, is is something that I think can work. And I'm working with the legislature uh, in the next session if I'm elected to do that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Charles, do you um, have a question for a candidate here at the table? Uh, yeah, my question is actually for uh, two candidates, uh, Mr. Scott and Ms. Holquist. Uh, may not know, uh, I was escorted out of the last debate in Rutland and uh, because I stood up and asked to be included in the debate because I'm on the ballot. And the only ones that are allowing in the debate are the Republican and the Democrat. The independents are not being allowed in the debates. There's one more debate coming up at VPR. We've been told we're not welcome. Um, James, uh, Mr. Jeffords would never take part in a debate unless everybody else was included. I've asked both Mr. Scott and Ms. Holquist to stand down from debates until we're all included. Um, they've refused to do that. This disenfranchises hundreds of thousands of Vermont voters. What's your question? So my question is, for the last debate, will you guys please stand down unless we're all included? And if not, could you explain why you won't do that? Christine. I, I, I uh, d defer to comment on that. I, 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 you know, I, I'm the underdog here, so it's, uh, I, I certainly, uh, and, and the answer is, I, no, I won't step down. So you'll disenfranchise Vermont. Phil home. Scott? Well, we went through this in the last uh, election cycle, as some of you might remember. Uh, I said the same thing. I thought that all candidates should be included in all the debates. Uh, and I, when I was invited to Tunbridge, uh, and it was the WDEV debate, uh, and Mike Smith was the one uh, that uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, moderating that, and uh, and I said that I wouldn't go unless all the candidates were invited. Uh, Bill Lee was not invited, uh, and so I said I wasn't going. And so they had a, an empty chair there in Tunbridge. There was only one candidate that showed up, uh, and they had the debate without me. Um, unfortunately, it didn't have much effect on anyone, uh, and uh, no one uh, seemed to, to notice or care or, or whatever. So this time around, uh, I said, uh, look, I, I think everyone should be included. Uh, we put it on every single response uh, that we encourage uh, other candidates, we encourage uh, the, whoever is putting it on to invite everyone. Uh, I think it's important for democracy. I think it's important for everyone uh, to have their voices heard. And then we hear it, the different perspectives. So uh, I'm in favor of it, uh, but as far as I stood down last time, it didn't seem to have much effect. Uh, and, I, and I encourage anyone else uh, to include everyone in the, in the debates I th because I think it's important. So Thank that's you. a no, you won't I, stand I'm not down. going to stand down uh, in this time around because, as I said, uh, I, I wasn't, it, it didn't seem to have any effect on anyone uh, at that point. But I encourage them. I stand here publicly asking anyone in the future that when we have these debates, they should include everyone. Thank you very much. Chris Erickson, do you have a question for candidates? Yes, I do, for Christine Halquist and Phil Scott. This is the first time in my life I have ever seen you or met you. So absentee voting started almost a month ago. People have been voting for a month. I have been excluded from every single debate the two of you have been in. Are you, my question is, are you seriously, willfully, and intentionally committing fraud in a fiduciary capacity in conspiracy with Vermont Public Radio and Vermont PBS to commit fraud in the use of taxpayer dollars? Our federal taxes get paid to the, to the government. 
Okay. The United States Congress. Your question is. Question. Yeah, I'm not finished. Clear. The United States Congress votes to give our tax dollars to public broadcasting. Public broadcasting gives our federal tax dollars to VPR and Vermont PBS. They have no legal right to act as a political action committee to promote two candidates while excluding five candidates. What's your Therefore, are you seriously, willfully, in, and intentionally in conspiracy to commit fraud in a fiduciary capacity with the illegal use of federal tax dollars Thank you. to promote your campaigns? We're done. Thank you. Uh, no. Sorry, your oh, answer. Oh, no, we're not done. No, no we're, we're, we're not done. We're done with the question. Wait, no. I the question. question. Said no, it twice. Uh, we're good. No, I'm not willfully doing anything to prevent anyone from coming to any debates. No. By your presence, you, by you showing up, you are taking the advantage of the federal tax dollars that everyone has paid. I'll right. answer the you same way You are taking the advantage of the before. federal tax dollars. Chris, just let's leave it with the question, and then let's get an answer. So we have an answer from the governor, Christine Halquist. Well, I, I take that under advisement. Um, certainly, uh, you know, I, 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 we, we can, the, our two, the two of us can talk, talk offline about this, but at this point, you know, I, I, this, this is really, the, these others set up the rules. So, so you know, I, I'm new to this oh, game. So. Oh, if somebody sets up the rule to commit a crime, then you just go and partake of it? And that's okay? No, it's not okay. You have used federal tax dollars to promote your campaigns at the exclusion of ours. Thank you. Thank you. You are co-conspirators to a criminal activity. Stephen. Okay. Do you have a question for the candidates? Steve yes. Um, yeah. I believe that, that we need a constitutional amendment in Vermont to give the earth rights and, and um, the rights of nature. And I would like to ask every, um, every candidate a yes or no question whether they support a constitutional amendment that would give the earth rights. If corporations are considered people, why shouldn't the earth be considered person? The earth gives us everything that we have, including our bodies. So you have a minute, Trevor. Uh, personally, I would answer that with a different logic in that I would say that I wholeheartedly disagree with Citizens United. I think when we're dealing with the democratic process and dealing with politics, politics in its essence is about people, the proverbial Zoom politicon. So we, as people, need to say that only people as individuals can participate in this process and be recognized. And corporate donations cannot be qualified as an individual or human entity. It just, it's not logical. Thank you. M. Payton, your response to Steve Mark's question. Right. Could you just restate the question? Should there be a, a, should there be a constitutional amendment in Vermont to give the earth rights? Thank you. Of course, we should revisit the Constitution. It's a living document, and women have not been participating in that. And I want to add that one of the things we can do, and that I have done, is to pledge my allegiance not to a corporate empire, but rather to go like this. I pledge allegiance to the earth upon whom all life depends, and to the beings with whom we share her, our Earth of the universe, beauteous beyond comprehension. That is where I pledge my heart, my will, and my life. Thank you very much. Governor Scott. Well, again, it would really depend on what it says, but I can tell you uh, it's very difficult to change the Constitution in Vermont, as it should be. Uh, it's a document Artists. that should be preserved. Um, we, I know a number of uh, times uh, throughout the last 20 years, uh, they've tried to t turn uh, the, the governor's term into a four-year term instead of a two-year term. We're one of only two states that have two-year terms. Uh, that's been passed out of the Senate uh, at least once, never in the, in the, in the uh, uh, House of Representatives that I know, uh, but it has to go through two bienniums, then a referendum uh, to the people. Uh, so I would say, uh, I would advocate, if you, if you want to do that, work with the legislature, uh, see if you can get it through. But it's very, very difficult to get any uh, yeah, type know. of... Uh, it's the hardest legislature to would change. You, yeah, I, would you support that? Well, I mean, I, it would depend on what it says. To blank, uh, just to say you would support, uh, if it's a simple, simple type of uh, a piece of legislation, a constitutional change, 
I'd have to read it to see if I'd support it or not. Um, but in, in concept, uh, of course the earth is important to us. Uh, of course it is. But just passing a law doesn't make it so either. Uh, it takes all of us uh, in order to, to make sure that happens. And that's what we have governments for. That's what we have a legislative process for, is to make sure that we protect what we have. Thank you. Christine Halquist, quickly your response. Yeah, I I, uh, I would have to take a look at you know what the con what it looked like and what it, and what impact it might possibly have. I've actually never been asked this question before, so I certainly have not done any research on it. But you know, if yep, if it makes if it makes sense and it's gonna it's gonna s solve problems, sure I'd support it. But but again, it, it it's as as the governor said, the process is complex. You know, I. I uh, I, you, you, I, just, I just don't even know how to answer that question right now. Thank you. Charles? I'm not going to do the, uh, I'll answer it this way. No, I wouldn't. And the thing is, given that, Stephen, um, you know, uh, I'm an Adirondack 46er. I hike in the Adirondacks all the time. I've hiked all the high peaks. I love nature, and I'm out in it all the time. And I think Governor Scott said, I mean, we all need to protect it. And uh, that's a given. Uh, I don't think a constitutional amendment is going to change that at all. Um, okay. Thank I stay you. out and enjoy the nature as much as I can. Thank you. Chris Erickson. Mother Earth should be made a citizen of Vermont. Thank you. Trevor, do you have a question for the candidates? I do, uh, and I'd ask uh, maybe for just a brief response um, from all candidates. Uh, with regards to broadband connectivity in the state and whether fiber is the best solution. Is fiber the best solution for broadband connectivity in the state? And Peyton, and let's try and keep it to 30 seconds so we have um, time for closing statements. Yep, I do believe it is, and I believe uh, that we have uh, another um, bit of brilliance from Christine about how we can bring that fiber uh, to every mile. So yes, I think it is. Thank you, Governor Scott. Well, certainly, uh, fiber is uh, is the uh, the backbone of uh, what we need in Vermont right now in terms of broadband uh, capacity. Uh, but is it going to be in the future? I don't know. Technology is changing every single day. I mean, we're seeing more and more in terms of satellites and so forth, uh, and uh, and we'll see where this goes. But we still need fiber, and we still need to make sure that we have a, a system that is backed up with fiber in order to connect it to everything else. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, I've been studying this for about 18 years, and I will tell you, I've looked at every technology, and uh, fiber is the best answer. It really gets down to basic physics. There's nothing faster than the speed of light. You know, radio frequency doesn't have the same capacity, um, and actually, with every cell tower, you need a fiber backhaul, so ubiquitous fiber actually helps you with additional in the cell towers, so it's absolutely the answer for the long term. Thank you. Charles? Uh, when I sat on our library board, uh, we were bringing it in there. It was a big thing. We could uh, get so much for free for a period of time. And uh, it's probably a great idea. Also, like Governor Scott says, uh, you know, things are changing fast. And like with our solar panels, we're dotting them up all over the place. But, you know, in five years, technology may come along, and all of a sudden we have all these things out there. and. Now we're going to wonder what to do with them because we have this much better technology, so I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Chris Erickson. Number one, fiber cables strung all over the neighborhood are ugly as hell. I've been in Chester, Vermont, 15 years, and then they started putting in these ugly fiber cables. They're ugly. They, they're just so offensive to look at. Uh, number two, low-income people in Vermont cannot afford Wi-Fi and broadband. What is the point of talking about something people can't afford? Thank you. I don't own a computer, but I, I think that we should definitely have um, fiber optics um, come up. In fact, I live on the end of a, of a dirt road, and EC Fiber, which I think we should be supporting organizations like that, just brought um, Wi-Fi up my road. Whether I'll have it or not is another road, another thing. But yes, I do support it Thank very you. much. And Peyton, do you have a question for the um, candidates? I, I do have a question. I have so many questions. Well, just if we um, could keep it to a question, not a yeah. statement, that would be great. Uh, I'd like to ask each one of the uh, candidates if you are aware and how would you implement 
a system of processing hemp to the purpose of building homes that sequester carbon and use a quarter of the energy to do so? And are you aware that hemp buildings can serve the same kind of strength for our climate change initiatives as solar? Could each answer very quickly. Governor Scott? Uh, well, Emily and I have actually talked about this on a couple of different occasions, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little more aware of uh, some of the building uh, capabilities. Hemp is something that we're doing a lot more of in Vermont. In fact, uh, you may have read some of that in the paper. There's been some uh, vandalism, damage, uh, and theft in, uh, in the hemp uh, industry, but it's catching on. Uh, it's something that really does have, whether it's in building or whether in clothing or within other, uh, some of the oils and so forth, forth. Uh, it's something that I think that Vermont can uh, capitalize on. So we're moving forward. Our, our agency of agriculture is uh, working with uh, those farmers and, and uh, trying to make it uh, make it go here in Vermont. Thank you. Christine Halquist. Yes, I'm a big supporter of hemp. Um, you know, in, in my energy research in terms of uh, growing crops for, for energy, which, which by the way, I don't think is necessarily a good idea, but but the hemp was the most productive carbohydrate per acre of anything. So as far as being growing things for for clothing and building and construction, hemp is a very productive uh, product uh, crop in terms of uh, uh, output per acre. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, I, I'm a big supporter of that too, and I've been talking to Em about it, and she's been discussing it. I've heard her talk about it at a forum, and I think those are good ideas. I mean, they're going to bring jobs in and uh, help the economy, and this is, you know, this is what we need. We need good-paying jobs and people who can take these jobs. So. Thank you. Chris Erickson, your view of the use of hemp as a building? My uh, grandfather, George Robert Erickson, was born on the Hemp Lawn Farm on the Benson Pike in Shelbyville, Kentucky in 1898. And then the federal government of the United States made it illegal. So I started campaigning for hemp and marijuana in 2002, and I'm still in favor of it. Thank you very much. Steve? Um, I'm definitely in favor of anything that will help farmers and growing hemp is definitely good for farmers and, and, it's, and it's good for the environment, yes. Thank you. Trevor. Um, I grow hemp, so I'm in full support of it as well as actually looking at the plant itself as cannabis, not only for construction but for health care and just in general for innovation within our economy. Thank you. Did you ask a question? I have not. Please do. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm a big supporter of our dairy industry. Uh, it's part of our tradition and culture. It's a $2 billion industry for us here in Vermont, and we've been talking about diversity and so forth. But um, my question is, uh, uh, Christine has talked about on a couple of different occasions about replacing uh, dairy with blueberries. And, and I'm just curious whether we think, uh, you think, uh, we should have uh, continue to have a dairy industry in Vermont. Is that for each of us? Yes. Christine? Yeah, I, uh, first of all, that was, I, I definitely was not about blueberry, that was way oversimplification about creating alternative revenue streams for dairy farmers to supplement their income. You mentioned blueberries. Yeah, yeah, that was an example. But the point being, absolutely dairy is important and, I, and, I, and, and the idea behind um, connecting every home and business with fiber is creating a distribution network so farmers can create additional value added products off of their farm to create additional revenue streams. Thank you, Charles. I agree we need to keep our agricultural farms. Dairy in particular? Dairy in particular. I know it's difficult for a lot of, <laughs> I mean when I grew up I, you know, a lot of my friends of course they were on dairy farms and things and you know I've watched it go away for them and uh, you know a lot of them grew up expecting that they were going to be able to do this for the rest of their life too and then they end up having to sell the farms and, and uh, subdivide the land and sell it because they just couldn't keep up with the profits, but yeah, we need to, uh, or with the bills, I didn't mean profits. Thank you. Christine? In the, 19, yeah, in the 1960s and 1970s, instead of putting people in prison and sending them to out-of-state prisons, a lot of Vermont prisoners were sent to farms. I'm 66 years old. I don't know if I'm the oldest candidate here, but when I was a teenager, Vermont prisoners were sent to farms. All the farmers had to do was, you know, give them food, give them a roof over their head. There were 25,000 farms in Vermont now, I mean then, and now there's only a couple thousand farms. Let's send the prisoners back to work on farms. 
as a economic development strategy? Yes, okay. yes, because you don't pay anything for their labor. They're free. Okay. And Thank the you. Constitution of the state of Vermont states that prisoners shall work for the public in view of the public. So we're wasting prison labor. Steve Marks. Well, I definitely support farms, but I, I would really like to, to um, see all the dairy farms become organic dairy farms. I, 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 it, it bothers me that we have farmers that are putting poisons on the earth and, and are spraying chemicals on their fields that are, that are bad for our children. I mean, and, and I'll do everything I can because I'm, 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 I'm in, I, I think that the way to keep Vermont beautiful is to have farms, and dairy farms are key. I mean, I get my meat and my chickens all from a dairy farm, a local dairy farm that's organic, that sells Stratford Organic cr Creamery ice cream, best ice cream around. Thank you. Trevor Barlow. <laughs> uh, yes, definitely. In fact, uh, even though I'm growing hemp, I bought a dairy farm, and so I'm, uh, uh, I guess, very respectful of our culture of um, dairy as an industry. I know when I've been able to go around the state and visit with farmers, um, there have two things that have come up. One is uh, assistance with marketing and funding to help them to expand uh, and specialize their products so they can get a higher premium out of their actual um, milk production. And so I think along with that, we should also work towards encouraging our farmers not only to be organic, but to be uh, carbon negative, which I think is possible because farms are a wonderful ecosystem unto themselves for innovation and for ways that we can lead the nation in agricultural production. Thank you very much. And Peyton. Yes, uh, one of the wonderful friends I've made on the trail is Roger Albee, who is working on a plan for all of our farms, dairy farms to become organic as a matter of viability. So if we were to have, uh, and, and we would when I'm governor, to have a Vermont credit card, we can use the profits for that. I would oppose any ideas that have gone in history that pl prisoners are slaves. I don't believe that anybody should be slaves, not in prison or not <coughs> anywhere else. But I do think that we can find the savings if we're not sending them out, that we are now spending $14 million to send them out of state to prison. So there's some savings that you can apply to the organic uh, and free range is very important um, because of the methane costs to climate change when you have standing uh, pools of, of manure and waste. So free range is also important with going all organic. Thank you very much. All right, so the last question. We have 10 minutes. It means everybody's got a minute. And the last question is, if elected, what will be your first legislative action? And we start with Charles. Uh, my first legislative action uh, <coughs> is going to be to remove uh, all cell phones and iPads from schools. Now, a lot of people, France just did that. And the reason behind that is uh, they've done a lot of studies this summer uh, throughout the United States saying that the effect of cell phones on students' cognitive learning is, uh, is bad. But of course, you didn't even need to do that study. All you had to do was ask teachers, and teachers would have told you this is a huge problem. Uh, I left teaching in June, and I left teaching because uh, I've been clean and sober for 27 years, and uh, during the time, during all that 20 some odd years where I was uh, addict, alcoholic, I, uh, you know, I wouldn't be disrespected, and I, I, well, I was always disrespected, I mean, so I could no longer allow that, and so I just walked away. Teacher's retirement, everything gone. I, I wouldn't put up with it. And uh, to change what's going on in our schools today, this is the first step. But that's the biggest problems with our schools. Okay. Not Act 46, any of that other stuff. Thank you, Charles Laramie. Chris Erickson, what would be your first legislative action? Well, well a governor doesn't do legislative action. A governor passes law after the legislature has had their hands on well, it. Well, what would you propose? Well, what I, my first proposal as governor yeah. would be to have a Saturday night 
Governor's Pardon TV show where mm -hmm. I would invite 100 audience or 200 audience people, how many ever can fit in that building in Montpelier that the governor's office is in, is in for an audience. And I would invite maybe six or 12 prisoners to come give their sorry stories about why should they should get a pardon. I'd have their family and their friends come and try to speak up for them or not, or the opposite. And then I'd have the audience take a vote. And then I would sell this TV program nationwide and worldwide on cable TV and put the revenue from the sales of the program into the general fund. Thank you very much. Chris Erickson. Steve Marks, what would be your first legislative initiative action, first thing you do right out of the box? Um, I would go to the legislature and I would um, tell all the, all the um, lawyers to sit down and figure out a constitutional amendment because that's, people have asked me why I don't have one. And I, I've talked to a number of lawyers, and every one of them has a different one. So I would get them all together, and I would say, you sit there, and you come up with something. And then I would start the three-year process of getting a constitutional amendment in Vermont. To protect the earth. To protect the earth. Thank you very much. Trevor Barlow, your first initiative uh, as my, governor. My first initiative as governor would be to create the Innovation Fund uh, that would be administered through the regional development corporations and as part of that set out the criteria for what we consider to be the new Vermont and moving us forward with revitalizing our rural areas through innovation and technology. Thank you very much. M. Peyton, your first legislative initiative. Well, uh, upon getting elected and if I can't get elected this time because people don't know that I'm a choice, I will continue, but the very first thing I will do in November is to go about and begin the history of the women who are behind the men, all the men that are up there in the State House and photos and everything. There are women beside them that belong to be up there so that young women understand that we are equal participants, we require equal uh, pay, and we also need to step forward to help men and everybody understand how we can prepare a world of nurturing and a nurturing economy. Thank you very much. Phil Scott, what will your first action be? Well, again, to continue the good work that we've been doing over the last two years, and Chris uh, landed on it that uh, we, we actually can't produce uh, legislation. Uh, sometimes you have to react to it, but we do have to supply a budget. So we're working on the budget, lives within its means, uh, and, and works on three different fundamentals grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, protect the most vulnerable. And with those three very simple guiding principles, uh, that's why we'll build a budget uh, that Vermonters can afford and that we'll invest in areas uh, to bring more people into the state and grow the workforce. That's what we need. The workforce needs to be addressed uh, first and foremost. Thank you very much. Christine Halquist. Well, I, I would ask the legislature to bring back the bills that the governor has vetoed, uh, increasing the minimum wage, family leave, toxic and toys, as well as uh, making polluters pay. And th the first new legislation would be related to climate change. You know, I spent, uh, 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 I spent many years working on this. When I left uh, Vermont Electric Co-op, we were 96% carbon free, and we did that without a rate increase for five years. The state actually exports $2 billion a year for the fossil fuel industry. Um, that, that will help grow our economy. I spent two years working uh, with the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation on a grant from the Department of Energy to write a plan called the Solar Pathways Plan that defines how we get to 90% by 2050. I would ask the legislature to codify the goal of getting to 90% to 2050 in law because that is actually something we will, that will spur jobs, spur innovation, and it does not cost us more money. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of the candidates here today on the panel for the race for governor in the state of Vermont for joining us here. Um, apparently this has been the only debate where all of the candidates have been invited and that is a hallmark of Channel 17 Town Meeting Television's approach to local government because we think the more ideas and the better, more diverse ideas that are on the table, the better policy that we have and people can make up their own minds. So I want to thank you all for being here, thank the audience and please stay tuned to continuing coverage of Town Meeting Television here, especially on November 6th when we bring you live election results. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So before you get up, take off.